Hi everyone and welcome to the News Agent podcast. I'm Sophia D. Clayton, Head of Content at Goodlord. Today's episode is a recording of our latest webinar. We'll have a look at some of the things that your agency needs to have on your 2023 checklist. You'll hear from Goodlord COO Tom Mundy and our Director of Tenancy Services, Rick Smith. They'll be joined by Sean Hooker, Head of Redress at the Property Redress Scheme. They'll discuss some of the changes on the horizon that will affect the letting sector and how you can prepare for them. So without further ado, on with the podcast. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to one of Good Lord's first webinars of the year. Um, we are still officially in January, so I think um, I think I'll wish everyone a, a happy new year and, and and a prosperous 2023. Today we've got a info packed webinar, which, um, as all our webinars are, is a um, CPD certified webinar. This means that it it counts towards your professional training for the year. So when you finish the webinar, you will receive a um, a certificate, which you can um, you can keep on file um, and make sure you count that towards your CPD uh, hours for the year. So with that out of the way, um, I'm going to get into um, a little bit of intro as to who Good Lord is. My name's Tom. I started Good Lord in 2014 um, and I'm the chief operating officer here at Good Lord. So that's who I am. Um, what Good Lord does, it's a end-to-end tenancy platform um, that covers um, all the points that you need to do um, when renting a property. We cover landlord terms of business, getting documents e-signed, collecting money, getting um, getting referencing processed, um, all the way through to rent collection, all bills included. Um, so really everything you need to be able to rent a property to tenants in the UK, manage your, your landlords. Um, and our goal really is to reduce the amount of time that you spend on admin. We want to help you with compliance um, and make sure that you've got more time to um, spend winning new landlords and growing your business. So that's what Good Lord does, but that's enough of what we do. Um, I think what we're going to do um, is talk about the things that are coming down the tracks in 2023, um, the things that you as letting agents need to be aware of. Um, and we've got two fantastic panelists to help us with that. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome um, Sean and Rick. Um, Sean, um, head of the Property Redress Scheme, and I think is about to take his camera off, uh, turn his camera on, but we'll um, we'll get started with, um, if you could introduce yourself and uh, let the the guests know who you are. Yes, good morning, everybody. And yes, Happy New Year into 2023. Right, my name is Sean Hooker. I am head of redress at the Property Redress Scheme. It's one of the two mandatory redress schemes that letting agents, estate agents and property managers have to be a member of. We are a high street name. I, I, I walk down the typical high street now and see all the lovely purple stickers that are on all the uh, the windows. Uh, hopefully you're all doing that because you, that's by law meant to display that. Uh, but we are, you know, one of the landmarks last year. Uh, not only did we exceed uh, six 16,000 members. Uh, we, uh, after doing analysis of our figures, uh, we are now the largest of the two schemes in terms of letting agent branches and offices. Uh, we're smaller in the estate agent side and uh, property management side, but on the uh, letting agent business, we are the largest. So really proud of that. And uh, hopefully uh, people who are members of us are satisfied with what we do. Uh, we deal with escalated complaints. Hopefully we don't get to see many of yours, but when we do, hopefully they are resolved in the most satisfactory way that we can. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sean. And I, so we're going to get lots of tips to say out of trouble today. And we've also got Rick. Um, so Rick um, is Director of Tenancy Services at Goodlord, uh, but I'll let him do his introduction. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for that, that warm intro. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm the Director of Tenancy Services at Goodlord, uh, a role I've been doing for nearly three years now. Um, but yes, I mean, what, what are tenancy services? This is all about helping uh, tenants uh, when they're moving into their home, uh, making sure that bill, the right bills are set up in the right name at the right time, uh, as well as making sure that you know they've got the they've got those broadband services that they need, uh, and making sure uh, our agents and our customers are rewarded, um, you know, with commission uh, as we complete those introductions. But a little bit of my my background, you know, my um, my blood runs true with energy. Uh, both in terms of the energy I'm, I'm bringing to this webinar, as well as the fact that that, that is my background, both uh, educationally and professionally. So I spent three years at British Gas uh, setting the price of gas electricity uh, for UK homes. Uh, so sorry, yes, one or two price rises uh, were uh, I was involved in once or twice. Um, but also since then, uh, I have 
uh, works uh, at Uswitch, the uh, UK's leading energy price comparison website, uh, as well as being uh, their energy spokesperson. So um, those who uh, those who uh, see, watch BBC Breakfast at certain times of year uh, may well have uh, seen me on the sofa once or twice. Uh, but really, what I'm what I'm aiming to bring to today's webinar uh, is a, an understanding of what energy changes are, are likely to happen in 2023 uh, and what that means for you and your landlords. Fantastic. And I think with that, we'll go into the agenda of today. So um, thanks very much for joining us, um, uh, Rick and Sean. Um, so uh, we've got we've got a, a lot to cover. Um, there's a lot going on. Uh, it is definitely a turbulent time for, in the letting industry. Um, there's a lot of change and it's it's tough to be a letting agent at the moment. And we want to make sure that we can give you as much information um, as uh, that we have. Uh, we have a lot of people that are constantly reviewing what's going through the courts, what's going, what's coming down the tracks. Um, and, um, and and this is kind of our way to, um, to, to, to give you that information. Um, so we're going to go through kind of the, the renters reform bill, what we know about that. Um, again, it's, 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 there's, it's still very early days on that and, and, and nothing, nothing is kind of finalized um we're also going to look at ropa and um there's ropa has been a topic um for as, for as long as i know um and um we're going to try and give a little bit more color um to what's happening there then we've also got anti-money laundering regulations. So um, this is this is very topical. Uh, there are there, there's definitely a lot of chatter in in online forums and um, and and some 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 pretty bad stories that we're hearing about how banks are treating people. So um, we want it, we want to give a little bit more info there um, and hopefully give some 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 tips and tricks. Um, and then finally, we're going to go on to. Uh, EPC ratings, the changes that are coming down the tracks, and um, and 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 maybe some some tips on energy prices, so that you you've got that information. And to give to your tenants or your landlords, um, so that they've got a little bit more, um, a bit more knowledge um, going into 2023. Which um, I will say that 2022 was pretty bad. Um, let's hope 2023 is not 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 so bad. Um, and then finally, if we've got time, we'll have some we'll 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 have some questions at the end. We will be taking questions throughout, so um, please do just fire them in. I'll be trying to um, feed them into to, into our panelists um, and get you those the, those those answers as, as as soon as we can. Um, but if we've got time, we'll 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 do some more at the end as well. So I think that's I think that's a good run through of the agenda. Let's um, let's jump into the first topic, really. Um, so um, this one, I think I'm going to fire at Sean. Um, the renters reform bill. Uh, there, there is a lot of change that is coming um, down the tracks. W what 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 should our agents know, really, um, about the the most kind of the most up to date um, kind of notes and, and and updates on the renters reform bill? Right. Uh, thank you, Tom. Right. So, so the first thing, uh, agents out there, you could take your hands out of your uh, your heads out of your ha um, hands at the moment. Uh, after last year and all the uh, the shenanigans that went on there, uh, we waited inordinately long for uh, the white paper to arrive, <clears throat> and then the whole thing went up in the air as uh, prime ministers and ministers and everybody else were uh, um, came, went, and uh, and and various things. Uh, happened last year, which I won't go into. Uh, right. So again, in terms of business planning, which is what uh, we're here for, and uh, all good businesses do business planning, try and uh, uh, prepare for inevitable uh, changes and things that are coming down the line. Uh, let's let me reassure you that whatever happens in 2023. OK, whatever is contained in the renters reform bill, you will not have to uh, implement uh, in 2023. This will the changes that will happen will be to the legislation, but there will be run in periods. There will be uh, plenty of time or some time for you to prepare for the changes. So there's nothing to uh, to panic about, but I really do recommend that you, you start looking ahead now and start looking at your processes and your plans to make sure that you are ready for this. Because what I'm going to say now is my view on what will be inevitably be in the bill, uh, definitely be in the bill, although the detail may change um, between now and when it, the law comes into place. So let's start with the uh, elephant in the room okay uh repealing section 21 okay let's get that one out of the way it's um look we've got lots of other experts uh, that uh, good lord have uh, used paul sampolina david smith other people they don't know a lot more about it than me but this is my understanding of where we are with with uh, section 21 we know politically section 21 will go OK, so the no fault evictions will not be part of the landscape uh 
in about 18 months time, I predict, maybe a bit sooner politically. We'll have to see how that goes. OK, and that is did cause a lot of consternation and fear in the landlord and letting agent sector. Now, let me reassure you from my what I've heard is that what is being proposed is not as bad as people think it is. OK, uh, effectively, you will still be able to remove a tenant from your property for but this time you have got to make um a, 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 a give a reason for doing it so um it, it's going to be a slightly harder um tenants are going to have more uh, uh security of tenure however you will still be able to get tenants out of your properties the one that i'm uh think will change maybe the most or is the most controversial is replacing the AST, the assured shorthold tenancy that we have all grown up with and got used to over the last 20 years, that will be replaced with a periodic tenancy. That is the plan. A, per a periodic tenancy, as you know, is a rolling tenancy. So uh, after the first six months of a tenancy, uh, um, a a tenant can give you notice to quit the property and um, uh, your tenancy does not have a fixed end date. Now, what can, what, what, sorry. Can, what, what can we learn from Scotland? Because that's been happening in Scotland for quite a while, hasn't it, Sean? OK, so my understanding is it relatively uh, they've adapted to it relatively. Now, you know, it, it, you know, there isn't a huge amount of kind of um, abuse of that. OK, uh, yes, it technically uh, a tenant can just uh, take on the tenancy and give you notice and away he goes. Uh, however, most people rent a property because they want to live in it and they want to yeah. live in it for uh, for a period of time, a good period of time. And, uh, you know, average tenancies are running uh, over three or four years now. Uh, to be fair, in certain parts of the country, if you get yourself somewhere nice to live, you certainly don't want to be moving because uh, it's very difficult to find something comparable and of a, 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 of a similar cost. So the security of tenure is something I think is uh, is important to a majority of, of, of tenants. Now, if you are in uh, the student sector, if you are in uh, a more transient sector, of course, shorter sort of terms are, are more appropriate. And one of the things that the uh, um, uh, we're talking to the government about, everybody's talking to the government about, is if, stu if students are on a periodic tenancy, well, well, how do you get them out at the end of the academic year? That's going to be one of the mysteries that the, the, the government have yet to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to grasp, because they're saying that if you are in a, um, a, a, re, re, a regulated uh, accommodation, to, you know, purpose built student halls, then you'll be exempt from this. But if you're, uh, you know, uh, got, got a, got a, a private, private rented sector property in the private rented sector which a lot of uh, landlords do then you, you're going to be treated exactly the same as if you're you're renting to a residential family so these are some of the things that are going to be need to be uh, to be looked at uh, so of course the, uh, the the big things are going to be if you are going to have um uh, 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 have to give reasons for leaving the property what are those reasons and do are the grounds that are covered at, uh, currently in section eight it probably won't be called section eight after this because they'll reorder it uh, are they sufficient to serve the purposes of a landlord so the big issues are what happens if i want to move back into my property at the currently there you can do that under under the grounds in section eight however uh it's restricted to only you and not to any uh, children or relatives that you may want to move in they're going to change that of course they don't want to anybody uh um renting out a property and then trying to move back into it after in the first six months uh so that's going to be extended um uh, also, if, they, if you want to sell the property, uh, they want to amend and put in a clause that's going to allow you to sell the property. Um, I've heard lots of things from people saying, well, how do you, how do you know? Can I just not say I'm going to sell the property and tenant moves out and then I, uh, I can uh, put it back onto the market for rental? Uh, they're thinking about how, how, you know, to put in some form of a safeguard for that. Again, I don't think that's going to be very common. 
you know, but but you know, a loophole and, might need to be closed. And, and, and what do we think the the penalties of things like that are? Because is is that going to be governed by yourselves, or is that is that something that um, will 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 be the, be decided by the courts? Do you think, Sean? I I think you know they're looking at the courts, and I think one of the things that, uh, with the courts is that we know that the courts are under resourced. We know that the courts are uh, slow. We know that the courts, uh, you know, it, it could be a long and tedious process and costly. So we um are very much pushing for mediation so early mediation so one of the things i i, I would uh, say is that even under this regime majority of tenants will leave because it's in their mutual interest to leave uh so if you serve them a notice at the end they're not just gonna you know they're, they're they're gonna have vindicated that they want to move on so you're bringing the tenancy to an end naturally uh and if there is issues like arrears or antisocial behavior which uh i'll touch very briefly on in a second uh then uh, um you know, if you had early mediation and not on the doorsteps of the court like the government tried and nobody used it, you need to get in early, early, early with these things. So literally, as soon as you you, you detect a problem, then you should be trying to get alternative uh, um, resolution to, to, to sort that out before, you know, at the same time, but before going to court. So that's something that the government is keen on. And I think we, we, we're getting that message in loud and clear. Going on to the arrears, they are going to, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, at the moment, indicate that uh, they are going to have a fairly robust arrears uh, uh, ground, which is effectively, uh, um, at the moment, you've got to have accrued two months rent uh, the day that you would present yourself at the court. So, you know, there are stories of tenants paying it down to under two to uh two um two months and then the mandatory ground is uh is, is negated and you have to go down the uh the discretionary one so they are talking about now introducing two months uh, uh in the last uh three years if it's if it's two months or more um rent is over uh, three times in a row uh, not three times in a row but three times over three years regardless of what the the, the amount that is owed at the date of the court hearing will become a, a mandatory grant so that is a, a positive thing for um uh, for, for for landlords and uh, agents so we're starting to get a few questions through. So um, I think I think one question we've got here is: Do you think do you feel the serving of new types of notice will start will still be reliant on correct documents being served at the start of a tenancy? Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. Oh yes, the checklist of, of of what you have to produce. I mean, one of the, one of the small the small things that they've got to address. Uh, is that at the moment one of the sanctions uh, uh, for not complying with, uh, with the whole list of things that you need to comply with uh, is uh, is that uh, you can't serve a section 21 no fault uh, eviction notice that will disappear so that sanction itself uh, which uh, uh, you know is a, a privilege you know uh, uh, will disappear so they're going to have to uh, think that one through and I think they may go as drastic as saying that if you can't uh, if you can't comply with these uh, um, with these issues uh, with, with your compliance, you can't evict at all. So that's the draconian uh, way that they might go down or probably go down. So amend all of that to say you can't serve what will be the Section 8 on this. Uh, so, of course, yeah, they will all remain. Uh, deposit protection, gas certificates, uh, not taking tenants' fees, all of these things there uh, uh, you need to comply with. You'll need to get your ducks in order. Uh, yep. You'll need to be up to up to uh, uh, fully compliant to actually get, uh, you know, access to the court to give you a, uh, give you a possession. Okay, good, great. Um, I think that's good advice. Um, and... We've got another one here that says, "What's if if a tenant signs up for six months? Um, if they only have to sign up for six months, um, what stops um, students, for example, leaving as soon as their course finishes? Um, you know, in in and 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 only staying six months? What 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 stops that? Do you think do you think student um, agents and landlords are just going to have to get used to um, long long void periods? Uh, they may have to, because uh, the government doesn't seem to uh, be budging on this one, um, despite the efforts of, um, you know, organisations like the NRLA, which are pointing out the, uh, the, the shortfalls of this. Uh, the student model may have to change. And uh, um, whether that makes it uh, economically viable uh, is a question that I can't answer um, until we can start to see some, uh, some uh, you know, some serious uh, statistics on on this but uh, certainly i know that uh, it is weighing heavily on the mind of the student uh, sector okay 
Okay, um, fantastic. Oh, I've, got, I've got one more, one more question, which is quite quite a niche one. Um, we're not sure if uh, I'm not sure if you'll you'll know the answer to this one, um, Sean. But um, if a property is owned by the church um, and the church requests it back, can they serve notice um, for the tenancy to end under the under the new under the new re uh, repealing of the section twenty one? Okay, right. So uh, you're you're delving into the depth of my uh, you know of my my knowledge on this one in the sense that. Uh, um, my understanding uh, is that there are certain exempt properties um, that uh, are listed uh, currently. Um, one of them is um, uh, 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 a church property where, you know, for a minister of religion, um, agricultural properties, another one is there. So there may be exceptions for that if they, if, if the, uh, if the property falls under that criteria now if it's just uh you know uh, a standard uh, uh let for uh, maybe a, a curate or a, a, an assistant uh, a priest or something like that that isn't the primary uh, um, vicarage or whatever then it might be different but uh, uh there may be exemptions for that okay fantastic um OK, is there anything you'd like to, to say before we wrap up on on renters reform bill and, and move on to Roper? OK, so very, very briefly, there was 12 points in the uh, in, in the uh, white paper, uh, which I hope uh, that you've all seen and read. Uh, it's quite a long document, but there's been lots of uh, summaries. Good Lord, have a brilliant summary on it. If you want to look at that, we've done summaries on our website. Um, uh, basically, m my bet OK, and this is uh, this is informed because I've spoken to ministers, uh, to the, the government. Uh, it will definitely be this parliamentary session, which will mean before Easter. So we're going to see something in paper before Easter. I think that they uh, um, will try and make it as simple as possible. So a lot of what's in the paper, some of the points there, things like deposit reform, maybe the pets and stuff uh, will be uh, uh, maybe not huge amounts of detail, but may, they may use a mechanism called uh, delegated authorities. So that will mean the Minister of State will have the right to do that in a later date. It's power to do that. Uh, what I feel is coming through 100% will be uh, because they've, they've commissioned a, a working group uh, to look at a portal. The portal will be a register of properties and uh, de facto uh, landlords and um, uh, letting agents but it will be based on the property they are going to introduce the decent home standard um which uh, uh along with the uh, uh reform of the uh, the health and safety uh, regulations will form the basis of what would be a compliant property uh and the, uh, you know it will be two ways one will be that uh, uh you know that will be a register of those properties but it would also be an opportunity to feed back to the landlord and agent community what uh, methods to help and uh, improve their properties can do. Uh, they also want to bring in uh, a new om ombudsman. OK, they're calling it the, the private rental sector ombudsman. Um, this is based on a lot of uh, uh, research that uh, or um, uh, studies that have uh, kind of indicated that having too many areas to refer complaints to is confusing to the to the consumer, to the tenant or even the landlord. And that um, uh, to simplify the system would be to have a single ombudsman. However, the way that they've uh, they've couch it is that um, uh, the property redress and the uh, and the TPO will still remain, but this will be a new ombudsman added into there. So I don't quite understand how simplifying the process is adding a new one. But, um, you know, again, the, the heat has been put on that. Uh, that's because of poor uh, AWAB, the, the little child that uh, died of uh, uh, in, inhaling spores from from uh, damp and mould. I, I know that was in the uh, social uh, housing sector, but the reality is that it will big uh, impact big on the uh, uh, on the private rented sector because statistics out there show that anything up to one in four properties fall fall below the standards for condensation, damp, and mould. So uh, okay. I definitely see that that's coming in. Okay. Um, 
Thank you very much. Um, there's, a, there's a lot in that. And, and as you mentioned, um, we do have a blog that, that breaks down all of these things and, 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 and we'll give you those, those, those points to, um, to, to research a little bit more. Um, so we're, we're going to move on to Ropa. There are a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I think there's a lot of questions on students as well. And I'm thinking we should probably be doing a student based, um, webinar, uh, later down the line when we've got a little bit more information on, yeah. um, on uh, the renters reform bill, um, and periodic. So, um, but let's jump into Ropa. Um, so what can you tell us about, um, What's happening with Ropa, Sean? Well, the government keeps saying that it's uh, they're still considering it, uh, uh, but they there is no indication to me that it is um, high on their priority list, which is quite strange because I briefly spoke about uh, the portal and I briefly spoke about uh, um, a landlord stroke ombudsman uh, coming in, uh, and part of that will be that landlords will have to comply with a certain uh, standard of. Uh, property and compliance, uh, which kind of smacks to say that, ironically, uh, a landlord could end up with more regulation than a letting agent, which is a bit strange because, you know, ironically, this morning I was looking at some statistics, um, uh, you know, to try and find out how many um, uh, landlords out there actually use agents. And it's quite interesting. Um, um, uh, the headline is that uh, just over half of um, landlords who reply to surveys such as the English uh, uh, English landlord uh, survey um, say that they use agents. Um, a majority of those only use them for uh, uh, for letting only to find tenants, um, and quite a low percentage, about you know under twenty percent claims to use agents for fully managed. So there's a lot of. Uh, uh, um, uh, a, uh, landlords out there that self-manage so it makes absolute sense to the, what they're proposing for landlords but 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 you know agents are you know are professionals agents are the uh the the, the guys there that have more knowledge um uh in theory than the, the than their customers and and so therefore it, it, you know as the you know the climate changes to more and more compliance and more regulation it makes sense that if you can't cope with that as a landlord, you'd use a professional agent. But how do you know that that professional agent knows, you know, uh, uh, more than you do? And, you know, OK, they may be a member of Property Mark or a similar sort of organisation, Ucala or um, a safe agent. Uh, but we know that that's not the majority of, uh, of agents out there. Uh, of course, they have to comply with all the law. We'll talk about that a bit later. But ultimately, Unless I go onto a Google review or whatever, I don't know if my, uh, you know, letting agent who may have only set up six months ago or even two weeks ago, uh, you know, we had a, you know, we're still getting new, brand new letting agents joining our scheme, and they they've not come from anywhere else; they're new. How do we know that they are up to the job? And Roper was uh, uh, what you know was going to be that benchmark. And when we were talking about Roper, uh, you know, that was the 80-page 80, 80 report, which the government has yet to reply on. Uh, OK, an 80-page you know, uh, report may be a step too far at this stage, but surely, you know, the basics, which are some form of registration, well, hopefully that's going to be resolved with the portal, um, a new code of practice or a unified code of practice. So, you know, more power to uh, RICS and uh, um, uh, and TPO and other organisations that have guidance and, and 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 codes. But well, let's have one that everybody can sign up to. Uh, and training. You know, you are offering CPD points for this uh, for this uh, um, uh, uh, for this webinar. But you know, that should you know. Compliance, CPD, and training—you know—should be should be mandatory in some shape or form. To what extent is going to be the debate, uh, and overall, an independent regulation? Because it's fine to have all these rules and regulations, but what are the consequences? Who is going to enforce it? So those are the basic kind of uh, um, tenants of Roper. Uh, the government have said that they, uh, in uh, you know, they they they're committed to looking at that but they're not committing to implement it so yes you know at the moment you know there's 
there's two two sets of agents out there. There are you guys who are listening here who want to do the right thing, tick the right boxes, and you know are probably joining voluntary organisations, are signing up to people like Good Lord to, and their services. And then you've got Joe Smo down the road, who's a, you know who's decided that he, this is a great way of making money, and uh, and and uh, you know basically just does the bare minimum to get by. He's undercutting you. You kind of think, well, what's the point? You know. You know, so, our, so, our our overheads are, you know, more than them. And yet there's nobody telling them that they can't operate in the market. So do we have any indications of um, how far away we are from um, seeing anything on, on, on Roper, Sean? Oh, if, if they surprise me and they include it in this in this uh, uh, um, bill, I would be very surprised. Uh, I think we're still looking. Um, I, I've got, look, I've got, I've got to commit. I'm going to say I don't think they're going to introduce it. Uh, this this parliament okay, okay. well i'm going to like, yeah the go likelihood by. then that, that there may be a new a, a new administration uh, even a new party uh we know that the labor party is more in favor of this uh, uh or wants to act faster than this uh on this sort of thing so let's wait and see on that so i'll buy you a hat for our for our next webinar that uh that can... <laughs> if it's a cake i'll, I'll eat it yeah <laughs> um okay fantastic and um i suppose just um just kind of kind of um touching on this one what what, what if 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 any well i know it's obviously still quite vague at this point but what are the, what were the consequences of 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 not failing to uh, of failing to comply um with this type of regulation Okay, right. Okay, uh, I'm going to quit my notes here. I'm going to run this through in in in, in 15 seconds. All the things that uh, a, a letting agent can end up if they don't comply. Not being a member of a redress scheme, five thousand pounds lettings, thousand pounds for for, for a state agency. Uh, not being a member uh, of a client money protection, up to thirty thousand pounds, but but the uh, local authority can find you six thousand pounds. Fees not being displayed. Okay, and I know fees have been abolished for tenants, but uh, but landlords still a pay fee up to five thousand uh, pounds a gas safety certificate six thousand pounds or prison okay electrical safety thirty thousand uh, pounds deposit three times the deposit um, and these are just things that uh, uh, you know the letting agent uh, can uh, can get done for as well as the la- licensing now okay that falls mainly on the landlord but agents are you know are liable as well up to thirty thousand pounds and rent repayment orders for your landlords uh tenant tenant uh fees act uh charging uh, uh tenants tenants fees unlimited fine and banning orders um or thirty thousand pounds if the uh, local authority takes uh, takes it easy on you and gives you a fixed uh, fixed penalty. And again, it's landlords and uh, uh, agents can be prosecuted under that. Um, uh, I said deposits five thousand uh, pounds, or uh, if you go over the the five or six uh, uh, the five or six weeks, depending on uh, uh, you know the cap the cap limit, it's five thousand pounds for charging um, a deposit over that. Smoke alarms that uh, you know just coming five thousand pound breach. Yes, I know this all depends on uh, on enforcement, but every week uh, I see that more and more authorities are enforcing this. They see this as a nice little uh, way of supplementing their, uh, you know, the council income. Uh, the government has uh, released a, a sum of money to various councils to uh, prioritise enforcement. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of consequences for not being uh, upfront and, uh, uh, you know, with the compliance. Uh, however, regulation would help that because it would uh, it would it would solidify this all into one regime. Hundred percent, and I think a lot of the things that you've you've just um, scared us all, um, and probably given people many heart attacks. Um, mm. uh, they're, they're things that that good agents are doing already. Um, so I think the the kind of the positive note for you know the the uncertainty that we have from from Roper is that as long as as long as you're you know you're you're you're, you're currently kind of following the rules and and adhering to the legislation and 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 kind of listening to webinars like this and and, and making sure you're abreast of the of, of what's coming down the tracks, you, you're probably going to be okay. Um, and it, it's it's going to be more of registration than it is going to be big business change. Um, and and actually, it probably will set you a, a, apart from the, the 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 kind of the agents that aren't listening to the webinars, um, as, as as Sean mentioned. Um, we've got one. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, I mean, Tom, if you if you if you join someone like Property Mark, they'll 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 do audits for you. And I know that Good Lord also do an, an audit uh, process. Uh, again, so if you need any help out there, there is help out there to get. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, Property Mark just take. 
taken on Darren Kitchenside, who was, used to work for My Deposits, was a part of our compliance uh, um, regime for My Deposits and client money protection. So there are people out there that can help you audit your, uh, uh, you, you know, your businesses to make sure that you're up to speed on all the uh, regulations that you need. So you don't need to, uh, you know, to second guess this. You, you, there are people there that can help you. So please reach out to them. Fantastic. Um, one, one question we've got um, from Penny is um, uh, if you if you see an agent that isn't um, displaying their fees correctly, um, who should you report that to? Uh, well, to, you know, uh, uh, national trading standards. So uh, you, you can contact your national trading standards through citizens advice uh, and report those. You, you know, you may want to kind of like, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, get landlords to do that, uh, you, know, you know, but of course, uh, if you if you find that just do report them because it's not in your interest to allow them to uh, to, to, mm. to keep trading. But national trading standards, local national trading standards. Look, in the extreme, if, if if they're ignoring you, there is a national trading standards estate agents and letting agents team. Now they don't want to take uh, you know too many direct cases on, but if you are aware of serious uh, uh, mal- malfeasance in, in in an agent, you can go to them directly to them. Uh, again, um, you know. Uh, uh, if we come across any of those people in uh, type of people in the uh, in 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 the property redress scheme, although majority of our cases are private resolutions, if we spot serious uh, uh, you know uh, uh, non-compliance, we do report. We have a, a memorandum of understanding. We report those cases. So you Fantastic. know, don't 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 just kind of like say it's none of my business. Okay, great. Um, it's making the industry better for everyone, I suppose. Um, so, and w- one more question before, and I think it's quite linked to that one. Is it just going to be trading standards that polices these things, or is it? Is it? Are there are there multiple bodies that that really do this? I think it will be a collegiate um, approach. I think uh, well, definitely environmental health will be involved because when we're talking about property standards, so most uh, councils or a lot of councils have some form of uh, private rented sector um, team uh, that may or may not, uh, uh, you know, work in, uh, in co- collegiate with trading standards, uh, you know, uh, you we, can't, we haven't got time to go into all the nuances of local government, but you know there are different levels, some and different councils have different cooperation. But there will, it should be a collegiate uh, uh, approach. And one of the things that I've said to the government is that you know we we need to have some you know the guidance out there so that you can uh, you know work get councils to work efficiently together to uh, to deal with this issue. Fantastic. Um, right. So um, we're, we're going to move on to anti money laundering. Um, Nice fun topic for everyone. Um, so, uh, Sean, could you um, could you could you just recap on what the responsibilities for a letting agent are when it comes to to, to the anti money laundering fifth directive? Oh joy, oh joy, anti money laundering. Right. Okay. So uh, again, I am not an expert on this, but this is my understanding of what uh, the situation is at the moment. So, um, if you are an estate agent engaged in estate agent business, okay, then you must by law be uh, uh, registered for anti-money laundering with HMRC, the tax people. Okay. Lettings is different. Lettings is, you know, more ambiguous. Uh, uh, Basically, the mandatory uh, um, provision for you to to have to register with HMRC um, for money laundering is only if you take in excess of 10,000 euros a month, a month in rent. Okay, right. So, which I've worked out uh, on on my little calculator is eight thousand and eight hundred eight thousand eight hundred pounds approximately, when translated into good old pounds, shillings, and pence. Of course, you've got to keep an eye on the exchange rate on that because that limit is in euros. Okay, so that is a very, very small percentage of the market. And I was thinking, even if you take into consideration uh, central London in HMOs where you've got multiple tenants paying in excess of £2,000 a month in rent, uh, then only a small number of uh, agents at the moment have to comply. However, we have all heard stories, and you may have your own stories, of banks being awkward when you come, it comes to compliance uh, and your client money account 
uh, if you are not registered for anti-money laundering. OK, even though you don't need to. And I was just thinking, if you are a local family, letting agents don't do any sales in Doncaster, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, renting out properties at, you know, to, um, you know, to to low income families, you are never, ever going to dream of getting anywhere near that hundred thousand pound and hundred thousand euro limit. OK, why? you know, uh, is your bank hassling you for, um, uh, you know, for joining anti-money laundering? Uh, and, and uh, you know, getting to the bottom of it, and that's because client accounts are big pool accounts, which have all your client money in, okay? And when banks look at the size of that, they kind of think, oh, you're, oh, oh that's a lot of money. Wh who does that money belong to? And because it's very difficult to get segregated client accounts, very difficult to kind of apportion it to all your landlords individually. So the banks are taking a kind of a very um, overcautious, let's say, approach to letting agents when it comes to anti-money laundering. Now, one of the things that they should be taking uh, a, a cord of, and jump in, guys, you know, if you know more than I do, because this is as new to me as it, you know, to, as it is to all of us, because, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a niche area. Uh, but, you know, the banks should be taking uh, account of, uh, you, you know, of the joint money laundering steering group. And this guidance, although it's not mandatory, is like the, the industry wide uh, in the financial services um, um, uh, Bible for anti-money laundering, and you, 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 they should not be kind of going outside of the, the remit of that, because you know essentially that little agent in Doncaster is not going to be a high risk in terms of, of, of money laundering. Saying that, you know, organisations like Property Mark and many others are just saying, look, just just bite the bullet, just make it mandatory for for letting agents all to join a, um, a you know a, 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 a anti money to register for anti money laundry. You then got the simplicity that it's it's unambiguous, you, you, you know. And 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 I've I've even heard that you know if you have a clause and you're a letting agent only, if you have a clause in your tenancy agreement that says if the tenant wishes to buy the property, you will become the agent and you will take a fee. That 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 you kind of technically are acting as a letting uh, a state agent and should join anyway so it, we could we could iron that all out the only thing i will say on that and then shut me up to uh, uh, tom is that you know it's again it's another expense and at the moment uh, uh, the fees are around about 300 pounds a year to register uh, but then you've got to have certain uh, delegated um, uh, people within your business they need to be trained at the moment i think that's 40 pounds per person to be trained uh, in in anti-money laundering uh, and then uh, there on it's a 300 pound uh, um, uh, a year reg uh, registration every year for this for the privilege of being on the uh, you know for registering yourself uh like anything else that could go up uh, for small businesses it's yet another expense maybe that uh, you know is added to all the other expenses so and there's the, I suppose I suppose there is also the, the the due diligence that you need to do on top of that as well. Um, you know, it's not it's it's not oh. it's not good enough just registering. Um, you you yeah. also need to do the customer due diligence of getting the address of your landlords, making sure you've got IDs on file. Absolutely. Um, are you, are you doing anti money laundering checks on them to make sure that they don't have peps and sanctions? So there is, there is a lot that comes comes into it. I think what we're seeing is we're seeing that you know the, the banks asking people to um set up individual client accounts is is definitely them being over cautious um we've 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 got a lot of agents that are coming to us for our lettings accounts package which essentially sets up client accounts um individually for for every every single every single tenancy um so and we do that automatically via apis um so that you you, you don't need to go in and administer you know 100 200 different bank accounts on your on your on your barclays online banking which which i think is is probably impossible um to be honest um with with how clunky some of those those websites are um so I think I think there's a there there is there definitely is a little bit of miscommunication between the 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 the, the different parties that are involved with anti money laundering at the moment. But the the guidance is very clear. The guidance from the government is very clear. It's ten thousand um, pounds. If it's less than that, you don't you you, you don't need to do anything. Um, euros. But, yeah, sorry, sorry, euros. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get your yeah, calculators yes. out. So, no, no, not very clear. It's euros, <laughs> not pounds. Um, but um, but yeah, okay, fine. So um, I, th I I don't I don't think there's I think we've we've had 
some um, we've had some questions on this, um, and what we've what we've had is um, is the ten thousand euros minimum for AML only for letting agents, or if landlords accept it directly from the tenants, do they need to be registered? Right. Okay. So, if if you are doing what let only, but the landlord is accepting that, you you know you're not doing rent collect. Right. OK, let me put let, let me put it on the line. If you have any suspicions, as Tom said, under anti-money laundering regulations, you have the, uh, the obligation to report if you have suspicions. Okay. However, if you are not holding that money, OK, then I don't think you Well, my understanding is you're not responsible for that. If it goes directly to the landlord, you've only just done the lettings and, and done that. If you hold that money or take that money and then transfer it over, then that, you know, you will have responsibilities under anti-money laundering um, um, regulations. So, uh, yes, yeah, so be very careful on that one. Look, again, you know, uh, good Lord, doing a fantastic job on this. Um, uh, I know Property Mark would, uh, you know, do do training courses on it. But if you're not a member of either of those, uh, a, a plug for one of your, uh, you know, regular guests, David Smith, has written a very in-depth book on anti-money laundering, which, uh, he, you know, he, he's very proud of. Is uh, is probably the most up-to-date anti-money laundering uh, 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 guidance that you can get out there. Um, I'm not on commission for, for, for his book there, but it's certainly worth looking up. David Smith of, uh, um, he, 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 you know, David Smith. Uh, Who's he working for now? Yeah, well, he's, he's a big solicitor. He advises the NRLA and everything. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we've got a lot of questions. I think I think we covered some of them. Um, if um, I won't plug Good Lord too much, but if uh, Lloyd's are asking you to set up um, individual client accounts, um, we, we we might be able to help you with that. Um, JMW is where David Smith's works. Yeah. Um, thanks to Caroline. Um, and. Um, yeah, I think I think that most of the questions, Lloyd's Banking Group do not accept HMRC as an AML um, supervisory body. Um, I, I I'm I'm not totally sure um, kind of what the um, what what Lloyd's Banking Group is saying um, there, but um, I I think I think that's again them them com- possibly conflating AML with risk um, in 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 one fell swoop there. Um, so I think I think if we move on to our, our final topic of the webinar. Um, we are going to be talking about EPCs, and Sean, you get a break now, so um, please take a drink of water, uh, take a breath. Uh, thank you for all that. Um, Rick, uh, can you run us through what's been what's changing in 23 and um, what our guests need to be aware of? Yeah, sure thing. So I, I think what we're going to break this down into is we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about sort of energy prices and 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 what we've seen and and what we think they where where we think they're going, um, based upon the available information, and then and then we're going to really start talking about. EPCs, Energy Performance Certificates. They've been around with us since about 2008. um, And really the rules and regulations and requirements around them are only about to get a bit stricter. And the reason that 23 is the time to talk about them uh, is because the average tenancy in the private rent rent sector is about 21, 22 months. And so actually what you're going to end up with is Uh, on average, the tenancies that are being created this year, when they end, uh, are going to fall into this trap of needing to meet the EPC requirements. Um, So without without going into too much, I've actually got a a graph on the next slide um, that we're going to talk a little bit about um, energy prices. Uh, So if we can just uh, jump on that one. Marvellous. Everyone loves a chart, right? Right? Okay. So we've all seen, we've all experienced, and we've all paid much higher energy bills uh, this year than we did the previous winter. In fact, they're nearly double, Uh, but they would have been a lot higher if there hadn't been uh, some government intervention. So this chart shows two lines. It shows the fact that actually in this world, we are talking about two things. We're talking about the energy price cap that's been with us again since about 2018, 2019. Um, And that's been sort of, that's been moving along. That is in effect a mechanism which calculates very simplistically what complicatedly, but mechanically, uh, a price that is a fair price uh, that UK consumers could pay. Now, if that was let to run run its course, uh, that would have risen to over three and a half thousand pounds um, in late 22, with a view that it would have hit nearly four and nearly nearly four and a half thousand pounds uh, in early 2023. Now, we're all going, whoa, you know, my energy bills are high, but they're not that high. Uh, and that's because the government stepped in uh, in order to effectively introduce a form of subsidy, uh, you know, some some money, both uh, given to households directly, as well as a direct uh, intervention to reduce the price that you and I pay uh, to our energy suppliers like British Gas. 
Now, I say you and I, but I also mean tenants and landlords, um, because these this is, this applies to all residential properties in the UK, all 27 million of them. Now, uh, what's been introduced is this red line uh, that's shown here is, in effect, the difference is the difference between the green line and the red line is the money paid by the government to help reduce our bills. And so, you know, what I'm doing is we're catching up to where we are. And all this white section uh, on this chart, so the sort of left hand half, is in effect what we know to be true because it's happened uh, or it's happened in the past uh, with a view that the prices won't change until April. And then the question now is what will happen in April? Now, you can see that the energy price cap chart line, that one at the top, we're not really paying that, but, but it's the underlying stalking horse, uh, is heading down. And also that red line is heading up. And that's because the government has said that they're not going to keep funding uh, the energy price guarantee, uh, which is that red line, um, in where it has been before. They've basically said, look, guys, we've helped this winter, but we're not going to keep helping. So there is a looming price rise for all consumers, uh, tenants, landlords, and agents alike, uh, where energy bills are likely to go up come the 1st of April. Now you go, okay, well, April, that's mostly the end of winter. So we hopefully should be spring by then, Easter, lambs, daffodils, etc. Hopefully, it should be much warmer. Um, and so there is a little bit of respite from the idea that it's during the warm periods uh, that the price might go up. But here's the, here's the little watch out. It is quite possible that as a little cheeky giveaway, uh, that the Chancellor Exchequer might actually say, hey, oh, actually, what we will do is we will continue uh, to help uh, energy consumers uh, by maintaining the price at £2,500 on average per year. Now, that sounds, that sounds good. Uh, but it's, you know, it's effectively a relatively cheap giveaway uh, by the government. It sounds great, sounds wonderful. Marvellous headlines, uh, but the reality is that it's spring and summer, uh, so there isn't really that much uh, bill reduction to be done, as well as the fact that prices are coming down. Now, why were energy prices high in the first place? Ukraine, Putin, uh, it is a fossil gas price crisis that we are experiencing. It is the, because the price of natural gas uh, has gone up as a result of the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, that has spread across the world. But now we are coming out the other side uh, of this energy crisis. We've seen prices come down. There are lots of headlines out there saying that prices are lower than before the Ukraine uh, invasion. Now, th that is a little bit of a half truth because energy prices work from both. How much would it cost to get the gas delivered today? That's one price or tomorrow, another price. But there's other prices. Well, how much would it cost for the gas to be delivered in the winter? Now, in the winter is when people are using gas. In, uh, in a relatively mild winter, people aren't using the gas. Uh, and so it is, it, is a, it is a conflation of these two facts, um, which, is, which makes people, makes these wonderful headlines, gas prices are the lowest since before the Ukraine crisis. Uh, but the reality is that actually the prices further out next winter remain relatively high. So the, the thing I'll leave you with on, on energy prices is that uh, watch out for an announcement from the Chancellor Exchequer uh, come the next budget uh, or budget-esque statement, uh, but also be prepared for energy prices to remain high. Like This red line is going to be higher uh, than it was in the past, uh, unless there are further government handouts. So what this means is that energy prices are high. Uh, tenants may well be struggling to pay those bills. Uh, energy suppliers are there to help consumers uh, work through uh, making sure that they pay their bills on time uh, and, and preventing the building up of arrears. There have been lots of stories about um, prepay meters being forcibly installed by energy suppliers. I, I wouldn't be too alarmed by this. This is a measure taken by energy suppliers to try and make sure that uh, large debts are not built up. Um, but there are enormous, significant potential impacts uh, from the idea that actually, um, if you can't pay, it means that the power goes off. It means that the gas is switched off. It means that those houses may be underheated. It means that your tenants may well be cold. They may well become unwell. Um, and so it's rich, which is why it's really important to maintain an open dialogue uh, with your tenants. Make sure that they're not struggling, because if they're struggling to pay their energy bills, it won't be long before they're struggling to pay their rent. And so making sure that there's an open dialogue uh, and you're able to direct them to their energy supplier who should be able to help them uh, with some uh, either repayment plans uh, or potentially even with uh, free to access uh, energy saving and insulation tips uh, and tricks. So that's what I was going to say on the energy price things. Um, let's move forward in a very related note uh, to EPCs because the cheapest 
uh, unit of energy is the unit of energy you don't use. And you don't use energy because your if your property is well insulated. So go on, let, let's talk about EPCs a little bit. Uh, we've had them since 2008, as I mentioned. They're valid for 10 years. Um, and in 2018, the EPC level E minimum was introduced. Now, we're all used to buying a fridge, an efficient fridge is A, A plus, A plus, 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 plus lots of pluses. Um, and the really inefficient ones are down at G and H and sort of off the bottom of the spectrum, red and bad and boo. Uh, and so these EPCs have been with us. The aim is really to try and provide a measure of how much it costs uh, to run the property, how much energy uh, it takes to run the property, uh, as well as the carbon uh, emissions of that property. So what we know today uh, is that uh, in 2020, the government effectively opened a consultation about moving the required standard to EPC level C. And they sort of go, oh, OK, well, that's that's significantly up from from level E. Um, and we and we actually know that two thirds of rented properties uh, are do not hit level C. So you sort of, oh, OK, so this is going to impact potentially uh, two thirds uh, of the stock of properties that are out there being rented today. The stated intention, now I'm, I'm very using these words very deliberately, stated intention, because they've been consulted upon, it is not legislation that has been brought in yet, uh, is that, the, that new tenants would have to hit EPC level C by 2025, uh, and then all existing tenancies by 2028. Now, this is the idea that clearly if you've got some, a tenant who's in there, you don't have to sort of uh, massively improve the uh, the efficiency of the property uh, whilst they're still there, unless you get to 2028. Now, 2023 is a little bit of a formative year. It's a formative year because, again, the point I mentioned at the beginning, which is you may well move a tenant in today, great, um, and they will, on average, uh, move out in about 21, 22, maybe 24 months' time. Fine. But that will end up just before uh, the deadline of likely the 1st of April 2025. At which point, in order to move a tenant in post-April 2025, it will need to be hitting EPC level C. So you go, okay, so, and this is why, this is a massive sort of flag to say, uh, help your landlords uh, by, uh, help your landlords identify what they're going to do in order to hit level C uh, for those properties that don't hit level C today. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have actually looked at an EPC. Like you get the nice, nice rainbow chart at the top, but actually in it, there are actually some very helpful hints and tips. So from the extent that you may be interested in installing uh, cavity wall insulation, you may be interested in installing uh, uh, loft insulation, double glazing, and actually the impact on the EPC is written uh, on that document. So that EPC is a little bit of a guide as to how to get to uh, level C. So again, as the properties come Coming up, for, uh, coming up to be re-let is definitely worth having a quick look, A, make sure it's valid, valid for 10 years, uh, but also make sure that, that your landlord is aware of, uh, if necessary, what steps they need to be considering taking uh, in order to hit that EPC level C uh, by 2025 if it's I a new let. I suppose we are also actually, you know, now is probably a good time to be, you know, using using the kind of high energy prices as a as a, as a good carrot to get those works done whilst you've got a tenant in, in, in situ. So so that come, you know, 2020, 2025, you don't have to have a three month void period for for the landlord because they're, they're, they're getting they're getting remedial works done on, on, on energy. So um, we, we, we could use we could use the, the high energy prices because like if, if an agent can if a, if a tenant can save up to 570 pounds a year um you know that is that is a good incentive to to have to have some builders in the loft for a, for a few days absolutely and that's 575 that's 570 pounds on average uh, that's going to be more available uh for them to pay their rent with uh if they are struggling uh or maybe there is the the room to to in fact um progress rents uh, more comfortably off the back of having improved uh the comfort and energy efficiency of that property. Uh, yes, there are some nice statistics that you know, efficient properties are worth more, that's uh, expense cent on average, and it may well help you access lower mortgage costs. Now, we've all seen the price of mortgages go up uh, off, the, off the shenanigans that was mentioned by Sean uh, in the middle of 2022. Um, so these are all reasons why investing in energy efficiency for your tenants um, both helps helps you, helps your tenant, uh, and really ensures that your, your property is, is uh, hitting those minimum home standards uh, as well as hitting the required level of efficiency. I will flag in this last moment, in this last breath, uh, that there is now uh, likely to be a 10K cap 
because if your property is going to take more than £10,000 um, to get to EPC level C, uh, in effect, that's where you go, look, I've spent £10,000. I've hit level D. Um, and that's where I'm stopping. And there is an exemption mechanism or expected to be uh, around that. That is a progression from the current three and a half thousand pounds, uh, which is where the current exemption occurs. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for that, Rick. Um, a few, a few, uh, we'll get a few questions in the in the last one or two minutes. Um, mm. uh, so we've got one here on, on which is probably quite topical, which is um, if the tenant hasn't paid their bills, who, whose liability is it? Is it the landlord's liability to pay those bills um, if the tenant leaves and, and, and leaves bigger uh, arrears on the property? That's a good question. No, uh, the uh, the responsibility to pay the energy bills is with the occupier. Uh, with the only exception is where uh, where there has been a bills included contract agreed um, either in the AST or alongside the AST. So no, the tenant is responsible if the tenant leaves. Um, leaving a large energy debt, uh, in effect, that stays with the tenant. Your responsibility as a landlord, uh, when you take on the prop, take the property back, uh, starts at that point when you gain possession of the property. Do not be lulled into the idea that you have to pay the energy bills uh, from the past uh, tenants' occupancy. Fantastic. That's good to know. Um, and then another one: um, uh, Are there any grants available for landlords um, to, um, to 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 get these works done? There are in certain areas, so it very much depends upon, uh, as well as the uh, as well as the income uh, of the occupier. So where uh, where your tenants are in receipt of uh, of benefits uh, and in a very particular and a very particular postcodes in the country, uh, then your energy supplier is able to help you access those grants. Uh, so that's that's one example. There's also the uh, effectively the boiler scrappage scheme, uh, which is a really about trying to motivate and encourage. Uh, uptake of things like air source heat pumps, as well as uh, solid wall insulation, uh, which is where uh, £5,000 uh, can be made available in order to uh, hit uh, and get those uh, new renewable measures installed. The one thing I will also say on that is, you know, if you are replacing boilers, uh, if you are replacing and upgrading heating systems, uh, make sure that you're asking for them to install a gas boiler by all means, uh, but let them know that you are interested in making sure that it is an efficient system uh, and that it is properly sized. They should be doing calculations to work out how big that boiler is. Just because one the previous boiler was a big, big old berfer uh, doesn't mean that you need to install another one uh, that's got quite such a large capacity. A well-sized boiler is an efficient boiler. Fantastic. Um, and one coming in from Jay Bull. Um, does the landlord actually have to spend the 10K on the improvements, even though they, um, they, they won't reach the required level? Yes, the current view is that yes, the 10K does unfortunately need to be spent uh, in order to justify that I can't go any further. Uh, and that's really the point. There is one other little thing that, that, that's in here, which is that if it, if a property is currently a D uh, missing out uh, by by one level, one rating, um, the expected average spend is going to be under a thousand pounds to get it from a D to a C. So, you know, some of these numbers are quite big, but, you know, given that there is a very, still a very large number of properties that are level D uh, shouldn't mean that there is an enormous bill. It should really be part of the uh, the business as usual, uh, maintaining your properties and improving them uh, and fixing any dilapidations. Fantastic. Um, we're getting more questions on the the names of the grants. I think we 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 may well um, may well publish something uh, that uh, that outlines that in a little bit more detail. So keep an eye on the agent hub for for that. Um, um, Tom, can I ask a quick question of Rick? You know, I mean, yeah, go for it, Sean. Certainly, we certainly start to see we're talking about carrots, and it'd be very helpful to see all the list of grants. I think it's very very important because I think it's the governor's track record on some of them, like the uh, green green homes grants, wasn't isn't great. So I think there will be some sketches skepticism about the availability of grants. Um, basically, uh, I've started to see a number of mortgage uh, lenders offering incentivized mortgage mm. mortgage packages for people uh, who bring their properties up to uh, A to C, uh, between A and C. Uh, what do you know about that? And are they, uh, you know, uh, is that increasing? Because I'm certainly getting the, the view now that, uh, that um, uh, a certain demographic of tenant is actively looking to rent out green properties uh, it's high in their agenda and not least with the energy crisis uh, they're prepared to pay a little bit more rent if their bills are going to be uh, less absolutely so uh, there's two questions in there which is which is the the, the mortgage uh, sort of availability of funding so uh, it's really about more often than not it's about new deals 
uh, and those new deals really being uh, ring fenced for properties that are already, uh, for instance, A to B or A, B and C, uh, for instance. And that, that really comes back to requirements that are being placed on the banks uh, to, in effect, act responsibly. They're also sourcing their money uh, from people who are interested in investing in uh, in socially equitable, renewable, and sort of net zero type target uh, investment schemes. So these banks are, are very much opening up the ways in which they can access the funds and lending that uh, to properties that are that are meeting uh, and fulfilling a sort of low low energy intensity property. So that's that's sort of one of the mechanisms that's there. And you know, we are seeing that some of the uh, mortgage deals are half a percentage point, sometimes up to one percentage point cheaper than the equivalent non-green uh, uh, deal, for instance. Um, and so when you, uh, and sorry, I forgot the, the, the second part of your question, uh, Sean. Yeah, it's basically the premium, the, the green premium, mm. what tenants are prepared to pay. Absolutely. And, and actually, because the number of properties who, which are A and B, for instance, are actually so few, and there aren't many in the rented sector, yes, they do go for a premium. You know, if you want to live in a house with solar panels, uh, for instance, uh, and go, well, actually, my bills are going to be very, very low, uh, in particular in the winter and spring and, and autumn, because uh, I've got solar panels, um, you know, there is a premium to be to be charged there. The, the reality is that the number is so small, it's actually quite difficult to identify the true premium. Now, remember, who's who's going to benefit? The, the landlord, in theory, has to invest in the in the in the physical asset, the capex cost of getting the solar panels on top. Uh, but the the tenant is the one that would benefit from from the lower bills, but the landlord might get the higher rent. And so striking that balance um, is is something that is yet to be truly proven out, I think, uh, as to whether it is to the to the landlord's advantage to invest in, for instance, solar uh, in order to grab that higher rent. It is the way the world is going, though. So I think, you know, landlords that are ahead of that 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 curve will um, will definitely clean up in the future. Very much um, so. Fantastic. Well, we are we are we are over time. Um, we've had some fantastic questions. Uh, we've had some uh, great re responses and, and some really really good information from our panelists. So, um, just want to say a big thank you to to Sean and Rick for uh, your time um, and your knowledge. Um, but uh, most of all, thank you to um, all our attendees. We wouldn't be doing these webinars if you didn't turn up. Um, so um, it would just be a bit sad if all three of us were talking away. Um, but um, really enjoy the questions. Love it when it's interactive. We, it feels like we've got um, two takeaways. One, one a student-focused um, webinar, which we will be pulling together. Um, and uh, Rick's going to pull together all the names of the grants and stick it on, on the Agent Hub. So, um, so you've got some material to um, talk to your landlords about. So um, thank you very much. Have a fantastic Tuesday um, and rest of the week. And um, thank you for joining. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.